This month marks one year since health insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act began. And from the president's point of view, so far, so good. More than 10 million Americans who didn't have health insurance before have signed up. But congressional Republicans are gunning for Obamacare. Even if they can outright repeal it, they want an overhaul. And with the debate just getting underway, author Stephen Brill, who has spent the past two years immersing himself in the subject, has come out with a new book, America's Bitter Pill, that takes a comprehensive look at what the new law does and doesn't do. Brill argues that Obamacare is the product of what he calls an orgy of lobbying and backroom deals in which just about everyone with a stake in the $3 trillion a year health industry came out ahead, except the taxpayers. Good news, more people are going to get health care. Bad news, we have no way in the world that we're going to be able to pay for it. Stephen Brill says that the outrage is what the Affordable Care Act doesn't do. It doesn't do anything on uh, medical malpractice reform. It doesn't do anything to control drug prices. It doesn't do anything to control hospital profits. Prices. So all the cost controlling side of this just went by the wayside. 99% of it. Brill learned that when it came to controlling costs, the White House was told up front after costs, you're never going to get anything passed because the lobbyists won't, you know, will just not allow it to be passed. So let's go through what each entity won. The drug companies, you know, they were going to get 200 plus billion dollars worth of new customers able to pay for drugs. They were going to avoid the calamity of the real reforms that they were worried about. Price controls generally. Canada. You and I being able to buy drugs from Canada, that would have cost them hundreds of billions. The hospital lobby did agree to cuts in how much the federal government compensates them for Medicare patients. But Brill says overall, the trade-off in new paying patients would more than make up for that. And the hospitals managed to keep other cost controls completely off the table, allowing them to charge whatever they can get for hospital stays and greatly mark up drug and test prices. In writing his book, Brill wanted to find out how hospitals jack up those prices. He found the answer in the Retchy family of Lancaster, Ohio. Their experience, both before and after Obamacare kicked in, shows all the things Brill says the law should have dealt with, like highly inflated hospital charges, but didn't. I just want to get healthy, and that's what I told him. Yeah. Their story begins in 2012 when Sean Retchie, then 42, father of two, was diagnosed with cancer, stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I have two young children, you know. I want to see them get married. I want to see my grandchildren. Um, you know, too early. Stephanie was determined to get him to MD Anderson in Houston, one of the premier nonprofit cancer centers in the country. But because their health insurance policy was so limited, they had to pay up front. First, $48,900 for the evaluation, then more for the actual treatment. They told me that um, we would have to give them another $35,000 to get him to get chemo. Did you have the money? I didn't. My mother did. Your mother had to give you the money? Yes. I just kept thinking in the back of my mind, there's a mistake and we'll work it out. I just have to get him there and I have to get him better. That was my main concern. When Sean was sick, they felt vulnerable and scared. Like most people in that kind of crisis, they never once asked what any specific item or test cost. When they got the bill, they gave it to Stephen Brill, who found charges he couldn't believe. The first thing I saw in their bill was um, a, a generic Tylenol for $1.50. Now that's not one pill? One pill. You can buy a hundred uh, generic titles for the same dollar fifty. So that's a thousand percent markup. But who cares? It's just a dollar fifty. As you start going down the bill, they had f something like fifteen thousand dollars worth of blood tests that you know Medicare would have paid a few hundred dollars for. The charges add up over the single spaced eighteen pages of the bill. Independent hospital economists say these are all greatly inflated over their actual costs. 
like a PET scan for $5,453, a 400% markup. Three CT scans for $9,685, an 1,100% markup. The charge for his room was $10,746 for six days. That comes to $1,791 a day. You and I need to get into this business. It's a really good, <laughs> it's they a call it nonprofit, but it's a good business. The single largest charge was for his cancer drug, Rituxan. For one dose, the hospital billed him $13,702. The hospital paid $3,500 for that drug. Okay? How so many that, times? That's a 400% markup. This is a non-profit right. hospital. What does non-profit mean? It means they don't pay taxes. That's the first thing they They don't mean. pay any, any taxes. No. But they've created um, in healthcare an alternate universe economy where everybody except the doctors and the nurses makes a ton of money. And nobody is holding them accountable. And Obamacare does zero to change any of that. MD Anderson declined to appear on camera, but sent us a letter defending the prices it charges patients, saying the costs reflect in part using and maintaining expensive state-of-the-art medical equipment and research to develop new and better treatments. But Brill says hospitals get some federal aid for new technology and says in general, large nonprofit hospitals are thriving businesses. He suggested we go to Pittsburgh. Once a steel city, today Pittsburgh's biggest business is a hospital complex, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. This goes all the way around. Its CEO, yeah. Jeffrey Romoff, showed us the view from his office. Here we are in the U.S. Steel Building. Steel defined Pittsburgh, and now you, the hospitals define Pittsburgh in the sense that you employ more people. Oh, we employ 62,000. We are not only the largest uh, employer in western Pennsylvania, we're the largest employer in all of Pennsylvania. It's a $12 billion a year global health conglomerate. By one estimate, the nation's top grossing nonprofit hospital. So what's your salary? My salary is, seven, is $6 million. One of the arguments against these nonprofits that are so big and make all this money is that so much of it's going to executive pay. But you I, make six million dollars and you have uh, seven executives here who make more than two million and you have another 23 who make more than a million. So let's add it all up. What do you have? A hundred million dollars on 12 billion. I can't off the top of my head calculate what percentage that is, but it is likely less than one percent. But it's a nonprofit hospital paying exorbitant executive pay. Well, that's your judgment of it. I think my board determines what the appropriate compensation is for me and for all the other executives. He does run a top-ranked medical research center with a reputation for excellence. And he says he's been trying to rein in hospital costs. And he thinks he's come up with a solution. We have our own insurance company. You have your own insurance company? Yes. As part of the company? Yes. He says the beauty of it is there's no incentive for his hospital to overcharge his insurance company. In other words, there's nothing to gain in inflating a patient's bill. We are the same family. It's the same kitty. And our premiums now are among the lowest in the country. His insurance company's policies can be used at his hospitals, as well as selected rival hospitals in the state. He thinks this idea of hospitals with their own insurance companies could be a model for the nation and the best way to reduce inflated costs. Okay, but you admit that you were part of the problem. Well, not only were we part of the problem, we were one of the most successful parts of the problem. So you admit that you participated in a system that just willy-nilly jacked prices way up. Uh, I, did I say anything about willy-nilly? I'm saying willy-nilly. <laughs> I'm saying willy-nilly. No, I'm not saying willy-nilly. Well, what do you have to say about the hospitals who are still doing that? Uh, it is untenable and unsustainable. To be fair, hospitals do save lives. As Brill says, they do God's work. In Sean Retchie's case, MD Anderson's treatment plan, the chemo, worked. I am 100% cancer clean and feel great. Even though he's $84,000 in the hole. 
Today, despite Sean's pre-existing condition, the Retchies have good health insurance because in 2013, they signed up for Obamacare. So now they have total coverage, 100% subsidized by taxpayers. So Obamacare has passed. Mm -hmm. MD Anderson goes to give someone Rituxan. Are they still charging $13,700? Well, they probably are if you don't have insurance. If you do have insurance, through Obamacare or otherwise, prices would in most cases be negotiated down. What about the Retchie's $84,000 bill at MD Anderson in Houston? It would most likely not be negotiated down because they signed up for Medicaid under Obamacare in Ohio, which is not recognized in Texas. In their letter, MD Anderson wrote, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, experiences like the Retchie's should become less common. However, the problem still exists. So even while some prices are being negotiated down, not all prices are. And Brill says that overall costs are still going up because there are now millions more people getting covered and treated. You know, President Obama says over and over that costs are coming down, or he implies they're coming down because of uh, the Affordable Care Act. So who knows, someday uh, maybe it'll be true. Health care costs have slowed down, though Brill says not because of Obamacare. And besides, they're still rising at a rate double the pace of inflation. The much touted, you know, savings that the president keeps talking about, it still increases. So instead of going like that, it's going yeah. like that. You know, if there's a stat, if there's a piece of data that comes out that says that the galloping increase in the cost of some aspect of health care has started galloping a little less, it's touted as the cost is going down. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. Brill says he has come to appreciate the good that the Affordable Care Act has done in that it's a safety net for so many people like the Retchies. But he wants the public to know that what was to be at its heart, driving down the cost of health care, was neglected. And it's the taxpayers who are left holding the bag. Obamacare is a government takeover of health care. That's, that's what the Republicans say. Obamacare is the opposite of a government takeover of health care. Obamacare is the taxpayers intervening to pay the private sector for their already inflated prices that they charge for health care. Is there any way now to go back and add cost containment? It was impossible then. It's more impossible now. When this becomes a fiscal crisis, that may be. Well, you have to wait for it to be a crisis? Of, yeah, that's the way we do a lot of governing in this country. We wait for something to be a crisis. When something becomes a crisis that enough of us care about, then the lobbyists matter a lot less because we care a lot more.